Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And it's so good to see um, so many friendly faces and names pop up. Um, some of you I haven't seen since really the start of the pandemic. So it is just um, lovely. Some of these names I haven't seen in years. Uh, Dan, hi. So good to see you. Um, so we're, let's go ahead and start with about five to 10 minutes of just seated, seated meditation in silence to ground ourselves and begin to allow the day to melt into the background so we can be fully present for tonight.
So, welcome everyone. And thank you so much, first of all, to the SF Dharma Collective for having me. It has, it has been a while since I've been able to teach. And it, you know, as a teacher, as this teacher, um, one of the beauties about teaching is how much it directly connects me into my own practice. And through my teaching and through the topics that I'm often called upon to teach, I learn so much from putting together the talks and planning the sits and from being in community with you. And even though we're doing this over Zoom, you know, there's this a feeling, right, of awareness that we're all tapping into and connecting to each other. And I feel very, very grateful um, for the time that we have together. So tonight we're going to talk about anger. And I wanted to say that I, I chose this topic for a couple of reasons. There's some obvious reasons. Have you noticed there's a, there's a little bit of anger going on in the world these days? Um, and it seems to be mounting every day. So there's this big kind of global energy of anger that many of us are hyper aware of right now. But that's not really why I chose it. I chose it because, um, and many of you who've sat with me or who, who, who've, who've had my teachings before know that I really like to teach quite a bit from my personal life because it's my palette of learning. And um, about five years ago, I sat a silent retreat myself with Trudy Goodman and Jack Cornfield. And at the end of that retreat, um, I decided that I was going to permanently marry myself. I, I had this, um, you know, solo life. I felt so peaceful all the time. I, um, I felt very blissed out. I'd sort of let go of all the trappings and expectations of what my life would be like if I'd finally found the love of my life. And, um, and at the end of this retreat, I thought, you know, I just feel so glorious inside that I'm going to not only marry myself, but I'm going to marry the, the Dharma. So I walk to the back of Spirit Rock and there's these, if you've been there, there's these mountains in the back and this creek and I got this ring from the gift shop and I called in the four directions and a giant crow came and landed like this huge crow landed and I, I did a ritual and I married myself. And I felt great. I put this ring on my finger and I just felt transformed as a, as a woman at 50 um, who had a hard time finding someone. I felt very transformed from just letting go fully of this idea that I would find somebody and then all the ideas that went along with that. And six days later, I met my now husband, Alex, who I married uh, this year in June of 2020. And um, I soon realized about probably two or three months in that I had a lot of anger still living inside of me through this relationship. And I will self-confess that um, despite the years of practice, 20, 25 years of Dharma practice, when it came to issues of the heart and of heart-wrenching relationship stories and of needs, um, the energy that built up in my system when I felt certain components of anger, which I'm going to talk about tonight, got so great that it was like coffee mug against the wall. And I would go to this pretty debilitating place of, you know, oh my God, what kind of Buddhist am I? What kind of teacher am I? How can I possibly sit in front of anybody and claim to be peaceful when I just hopped a coffee mug against the wall? That's not, a, that's not, I really did that. So I began to look more deeply at my own anchor and truth be told, um, I had been angry for a long time. I had had an aversion. I have a naturally aversive, aversive sort of character to me. There's a, there's some storylines and some narratives from long ago that 
equal, a slightly aversive character with me. And I had done a lot of work on them. And what I noticed through the transformation of my relationship that the difference was that when I could distance myself from any trigger, I was pretty good. I could work through it. I could sit on the cushion. I could kind of find my way out. But suddenly when I was in this relationship where there was more at stake and perhaps less time on my own, suddenly I was unable to discharge this energy in the same way as I was when I was alone. And I became pretty, pretty seeking and pretty searching on like, how do I, how do I mend the pain of anger? So that, that is truly what inspired the talk tonight. And the second story I'll share with you that inspired the talk goes back about six, seven years ago. And I had a very dear friend and he was born and raised in New York City. He had a biting sarcasm to him. He was very funny, but a lot of his humor um, kind of surrounded making fun of people. And it was, he was pretty funny. But as most of us who've been practitioners for a while know, oftentimes sarcasm is sort of underlying anger at play. And over the years, I started to build up a sort of anger um, for his sarcasm. And one night I just decided to, to, to let skillfully, truthfully, I was very skillful in the way that I told him but his response to me was, and you call yourself a Buddhist. You know, here you are claiming, teaching, claiming you're a Buddhist and look what you just said to me, right? It was this fantastic guilt that he laid on me um, that I also really appreciated because I thought to myself, wow, what could, again, like what kind of Buddhist am I? That I am not able to sit in complete and utter peace, zen, and stillness, and ohm out when anger might arise. And this certainly, as most of us know, is the sort of classic idea of, of what a Buddhist should be, right? That we should all just ohm out, that we should be able to find places of equanimity with ease, that we should notice when our emotions are arising, and we should just find ourselves in awareness and allow the emotion to pass through us. This is the, the holy grail of bodhisattvas, certainly. And this idea that we should remain calm and remain Zen in the face of anger, I think has a dark shadow to it for a lot of us, which is that oftentimes this is resulting in repression and suppression that can make us sick. Um, there's an inauthenticity to it that I'm certainly learning to bring forward in a more skillful way, in a more authentic way by using anger. And more importantly, and most of you may have heard of this term, there's a spiritual bypassing that can often happen when we get angry. And as Buddhists, we make a decision to perhaps repress, suppress, push down, let go, tell ourselves to walk away, right? That happens. And I got very curious because I've been using this term spiritually bypassing for a while. I use it in my teaching. I use it with my private clients and executive coaching. And I thought I'd never really looked up the definition. And so a couple of nights ago when I was working on my talk, I looked up the actual definition of spiritual bypassing. And here's what it says. It was created originally by John Wellwood. And it says, the tendency to use spiritual ideas and practices to sidestep or avoid facing unresolved emotional issues, psychological wounds, and unfinished developmental tasks. So I'll repeat that just once more because it had a deep resonance for me around these sort of three descriptions of why we spiritual bypass. So unresolved emotional issues, emotional pain, psychological wounds, and unfinished developmental tasks. So what this, what that last piece means is that, you know, we haven't done enough development on ourselves 
on our sort of our stories, our narratives, and that unfinished business, if you will, is still wreaking havoc. It's getting a hold of our of our of us, and it's swinging us around. And we use spiritual ideas to just sort of bypass it right over the freeway, right? So I don't know if any of you have done this or have found yourself doing this, but I certainly know I have done this. And it comes from a very sincere place, right? I want to show up as a kind person, a compassionate person. But oftentimes in doing that, I'm leaving myself out of that compassion and anger in many ways is a compassionate act if it's utilized correctly. And when it's utilized incorrectly is when we sort of get into the danger zone. So there's another way that some, you know, I've heard some people in the Buddhist communities sort of also spiritually bypass, which is this idea of no self. And this gets a little bit heady for those of you that are new to practice, but it's, it's easy to grok, which is that many Buddhist practitioners subscribe to the idea that, you know, when we can come to the place where we understand that there is no self and we're living permanently in a place of spiritual awareness, then everything that is of the self should naturally dissipate. And that is possible, I will tell you. I spent three months in silence in India in 2005 and 2006. And during that time, I can recall people coming in and out of the small village that I was living in. And I, I recall one particular time when a really aggressive male kind of came in and he was very fixated with getting my attention and he was saying things and doing things. And I remember thinking, wow, that is so interesting that he's doing that, but having absolutely no resonant response because I've been sitting so much in awareness. So that is possible. But when we come to the West and we come back and we have jobs that we have to show up for and families and kids and politics, sometimes our self rages its head and it asks to be seen. And so what do we do? Do we go to a place of no self? Perhaps if we're highly skilled in, in, in resting in awareness, but even then, even then there is truly an opportunity for us to drop in and just notice the energy that we may be running, even if we never take an action. Because if we don't do that, chances are we're spiritually bypassing. So I found this interesting statistic that when anger strikes, when we actually have that moment in our system, in our physical system where, you know, anger is hitting us, we lose 85% of our reasoning skills, 85%, which isn't really surprising when you think about it, but it's sort of surprising to hear because how many of us speak from that 15% that's left <laughs> that probably we're not, we're probably speaking from the 85% of reasoning that's gone out the door most of the time. Or if we're not speaking from it, perhaps we're turning it on ourselves. So I had a little comic I wanted to share with you and I, I realized it's too small for me to share on the computer so I thought I would describe it to you. And it's the cat and the dog and the dog is on the ground and the cat is sitting in the window and the cat saying, I'm angry. And the dog says, oh, it's okay. It's okay to feel angry. It's okay to feel a range of emotions. And the cat says, no range, just anger. Here's this little, I thought it was really cute and really funny because I have a cat and I know that he feels this way often towards me. So if this isn't about anger management, right? Because some concepts of anger management ask us again to push down. It's a feeling of even the word management is somehow that we have to get a hold of it and hold it back, right? Hold that energy in. And that's also not what we're talking about. We're actually talking about the skillful use of this energy that we call anger as the means to know ourselves in love more deeply. And I think it's important to talk about 
energy. And I'm going to go more into this later in the talk. But, you know, we name different energy resonances with different words that we call emotions. But oftentimes when you really sit with it, the energy level of anger matches the energy level of love, right? When we're in deep, crazy love, romantic love, that over the top feeling of lust and love, like we can't really contain it, right? It overwhelms us. And the same thing happens with the resonant ang of anger. It's just one is pleasant and one is not. And this is where it gets us into a little bit of trouble, right? Where it starts to become dualistic or divisive or it divides the heart. So there's a term and a lot of you may have read my bio. If you haven't, you might know a little bit about my story, but I spent about 30 years in corporate America and about 15 of those, um, probably more, about 20 were in dharmic practice. So I was always sort of spanning this strange world, this strange straddle of one foot in corporate America and one foot in the Dharma. And very actively, so I was teaching at the time. So I would go and lead a team of say anywhere from 15 to 60 people. And then I would lead a team of Dharma practitioners. And there's a term in, in, in business called root analysis. And if you don't know what the term means, it's really simple. It comes from manufacturing. And it means that it's also called lean manufacturing, but it basically means peeling back, peeling back, peeling back a problem to really find its true root, right? So for example, I worked on Lexus cars for a long time and on the manufacturing plan, if you were looking for, a, you know, sort of a root analysis and you were looking at potentially something going wrong with a tire, right? You might originally say, well, is it the tire? And then you say, well, no, it's not the tire. It's actually how my, my husband is on in the other room, but he's online. He's going to cringe when I try to talk about cars, by the way, honey, <laughs> don't laugh. But it might be a lug nut. I think it's called a lug nut, right? The thing that tightens the tire. Might be a lug nut problem, right? And then we look a little bit further and we find, well, actually, it's not a lug nut problem. It's actually that the women and men who are putting on the lug nuts are exhausted. And actually the reason they're exhausted is because we just don't have enough of them. And the reason that we don't have enough of them is right, is because perhaps there's a hiring shortage and there's a hiring shortage because, right? And you can play this sort of root analysis game all the way back to the origin that feels the most true for you. So what is the root analysis of anger for us? And often we feel angry when we feel wronged, when we feel dehumanized, um, and when we feel our boundaries have been crossed. We can also feel righteous anger on behalf of other people, right? Um, any people that are being diminished, dehumanized, abused, we may feel righteous anger for how we think the world should be. But the Buddha actually had two primary questions that he said, anyone who feels angry, you can boil it down to these two primary questions that we should ask ourselves. And question one is, how, how do I feel I'm, my needs are not being met? Or what are my unfulfilled desires? Another way I like to say this is, how am I not feeling seen in the world? And one example I can give from, you know, many of the clients that I'm working with right now is that we're working from home and we're on Zoom and we're kind of killing ourselves, right? We've got Slack and we've got email and we've got whatever, Confluence, all kinds of different programs that are asking us to respond all the time. And we're with our children and we're trying to manage our lives. And there's a way in which sometimes leaders forget to recognize their people. And I'm hearing from a lot of my clients, I don't feel seen, I don't feel valued. And it, there's anger and there's resentment growing and that can turn into, it can wreak havoc in all kinds of ways, acting out, shutting down. 
The second question the Buddha said that we need to ask ourselves when we're, when we're going to angry is, do I feel wounded pride? And this one's a little bit more difficult to explain, but essentially what I, I wrote something down because I thought it was um, a great way to frame up what pride is. Because Buddhism actually encourages confidence and honesty with ourselves, right? It, it, it encourages a certain level of um, self-awareness, self-examination. Um, self, uh, but pride is when we go to a place where we think that for one reason or another, that we're better than other people at something or in general. That's kind of a classic definition of pride. So they're not as good as me, for example, at this. Or I won't associate with someone who's not as good as me at this. That's pride. Now it sounds like, oh my gosh, Carrie, like that would just would not be be me, right? I don't ever feel like that. But there's a nefarious trap inside there, which is that there's ways in which we sometimes have built our ego, our ego a construct to say I'm good at this or I'm, you know, I'm worthy at this. And oftentimes that is cover for I'm not worthy. Right. So the, 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 the flip shadow to pride is a deep sense of unworthiness. An example of this is that I have a client who um, on regular occasion uh, feels like any constructive criticism that he's given in his job, any constructive feedback makes him incredibly angry. He, he writhes in pain at the idea that he's gonna have his 360. And it's not like he goes to a place of feeling small. He actually goes to a place of anger, which is like, they don't see me. This is a great example of wounded pride, right? Where, you know, there's some way in which my client feels he shouldn't have any constructive criticism, right? That he should be so good that it should all be A pluses. And when he gets any moment where there's like a feedback or a piece of communication that he gets where he could be doing something better, it just shatters him. So the key here is to really look at where am I feeling unworthy when that comes up. The Buddha also said there, were, there are two enemies, our outer enemy and our inner enemy. So the outer enemy is that external force that sort of brings up anger in us, right? So that could be anything from a political figure to our spouse, to our parents and our family. We know Thanksgiving is coming up, right? Perhaps some of us have beautiful loving families where everyone all agrees on all fronts, on all topics and you just hug and it's kumbaya. And maybe there are others of us that have had to work a little harder at finding agreement in our family or staying in our practice when we go home for Thanksgiving. Those are outer enemies. But the inner enemy is the enemy inside you that alchemizes anger into aggression, that turns anger into pain for yourself, for others. And we all know the old adage that the, the, the trick to our enemies is bringing them closer. And so in that way, we need to bring anger really close in, really close in. And it can be really scary to do this. And it's one thing to say we can bring anger really, oh yeah, I'm going to look at my anger. But when we're really practicing deeply with anger, it is profound and it can be, it can put us down on our knees in terms of self-knowledge, self-awareness of our own pain, of the pain of others, which also consequently equals deep love. Deep love for ourselves and deep love for the pain of others. So I wanted to read you a couple of quotes. One is from Adyashanti, who I study often with and who most of you know I read just about every time I've got his picture up here. He's one of my primary teachers. But he says, anchors other face is often a kind of extraordinary clarity. 
people don't usually associate anger with clarity. They associate that when they get angry, they sort of disorient and get not very clear at all. But this is when you either overly, ex overly express your anger, that means if you're projecting it or acting it out or denying it, trying to hide from it. But when you express it purely, it integrates into your system. And it is usually something behind it that is important for you to see. It is an understanding behind the anger. This is clarity behind it. There is a kind of vivid discrimination that is available to you. I love that line. There is a kind of vivid discrimination behind it that's available to you. And it is not opposite of anger, it is a flip side. Letting anger harmonize into your being can bring a real clarity. The second quote I found is from Mingyur Yonga Rinpoche, who says, we can see deep love inside of hatred, that we can find deep self-compassion and then love. And then I'd like to read one more. These are some of my, you know, the most profound teachers that I tend to gravitate to. And some of you know, this is Srini Zargadatta. He's a little bit more intense, but this quote is actually very simple and very short. Desire and fear. So we talked about unmet, unmet desire, unmet needs. Why don't I feel seen? Why am I not getting what I want? Why, why aren't you seeing me and my suffering? Desire and fear, both are self-centered states. Between desire and fear, anger arises. With anger, hatred, and with hatred, passion for destruction. So I love this idea of between fear and desire, right, is where anger tends to hang out. What is it I fear that I won't have? How is it that I fear I might not be seen? And what do I need? And in that, what's so frank that I'm learning with my husband is he can't give it to me. No one can give it to me. I have to heal that unmet desire. Of course, he can be the good guy that he is and show up. But at the end of the day, he can't give it to me. So working with anger. So there's this concept of anger versus aggression. And we're going to get, those of you who've practiced with me, you know, I'm a very body-based practitioner and it's okay if you're not. Um, we're going to work with it. But I also do a lot of like bringing it home. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes my talks go way out there, but this isn't one of those talks. Um, but this is really about knowing when we flip that switch from anger into aggression, even microaggression, and how we begin to slow that down so that we can get space to do our own work and heal our own shit. So a quote from Rob, Robert Augustus Masters. So if you don't know Robert, this is one of his books. It's called To Be a Man. He is a fascinating, fantastic teacher. Um, and this book has changed lives of so many men that I know. He's just a his, his way of being is absolutely beautiful. And he talks about um, anger in a way that I thought I would share that's very beautiful about the difference between anger and aggression. So a big part of the reason why anger gets such bad press is that it is, common, is commonly is made synonymous with aggression. But anger and aggression do differ and differ considerably regardless of similarities in surface appearance. 
Many years ago, a man came to me for just one session and only to talk. He told me that his wife was on the verge of leaving him because of his anger. He said he didn't scream at her, didn't threaten or hit her, didn't even raise his voice very much. He added that she wanted him to express his emotions, but when he did show his anger, she was really bothered by it. So what did he do? As we spoke, it became clear to me that he was not just being angry with her, but aggressive, mostly through a reasonable sarcasm, cutting her down when she displeased him, emanating a mild but unmistakable hostility. I explained to him that anger and aggression defined by me as attack, however indirect or soft-spoken, are not the same thing. Simply hearing this and understanding that his sarcasm was a form of aggression made a huge difference for him. He very quickly stopped acting aggressively toward his wife, and this had a dramatically positive impact on their marriage. So how do we distinguish aggression from anger? Here I am speaking of skillful anger. This is so important. Skillful anger, enlightened anger. He's saying, I'm saying that. He didn't say that. Anger that doesn't shame, blame, or dehumanize regardless of its passion. Aggression attacks. Anger does not. In aggression, we're emotionally hardened, whereas in anger, whatever, whenever it's heat, whatever it's heat, sorry, whatever it's heat, it's energy, we're vulnerable to whatever degree. That is such, I screwed up that sentence, so I'm going to reread it because it was my favorite sentence when I read this. In aggression, we're emotionally hardened, whereas in anger, whatever it's heat, we're vulnerable to whatever degree. So it's almost as if the more angry you get, the more it's calling for self-vulnerability. So hard to do and such a deep practice, probably the hardest practice of all. For me, certainly. You could say that aggression is anger stripped of its heart and care. Dehumanizing the other to the point of disrespecting, putting down or violating him or her. Or, or her. Regardless of its passion, aggression is not an emotion per se, but something that we are doing with an emotion, namely anger. To slip into aggression is to strip anger of its heart. So beautiful. And arm its expression with a de dehumanizing hardness. Aggression is a choice, a result of how we're handling our anger. Anger is not the problem. Our letting it mutate into aggression is. I love that. I love that. And when we combine that with spiritual bypassing, right? Like it really asks us to get pretty damn real with ourselves pretty fast. So what do we do? I'm saying a lot of words. How do we do it? Right? Because it's like a lot of good thinking and our mind can really grab it. But we know 85%, 85% of our reasoning is gone out the window when we're angry. So how do we actually work with it? So tonight we're going to do, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more and then I'm going to work with you on a somatic experience of working with anger. So as I'm beginning to share some of this next part of the teaching, just perhaps allow an, a, a situation maybe that has come up recently or that repeatedly makes you angry. It could be a person, it could be a, a behavior, it could be the world. It's better if, it, if you can, you know, find something that's easily accessible in your body to feel angry about. And I said earlier, angry, anger is really energy. It's a, it's a, it's a, a vibration, a frequency that raises in the system far, far sooner than we actually realize it's raising itself. And this is where mindfulness comes in. Because the more we're constantly, constantly have awareness on, attuned to our experience, attuned to what's happening in the system of us, of the human us, let's say, the sooner we notice, huh, 
I'm feeling angry before it can even get to our heart, our throat and out our mouths. So the key here is guess what? It's easy to meditators to slow things down, slow things down and not just slow them. I mean, I'm talking seven day retreat slow down. Like that level of slow, you know, when you come off retreat on that last day and you go to the grocery store for the first time and people feel like they're like buzzing around and it's insane. Like we want to cultivate that level of meta. I hate using, I can't even use that word anymore, right? Because of Google, but that level of micro meta for us to actually have meta, meta M-E-T-T-A. I'm just gonna have fun with that. I know on Instagram tomorrow, there's some meta with meta I can do. But anyway, this idea that we can really slow it down so that we can see the ego in its natural habitat. Um, when I was writing this talk and I wrote the ego in its natural habitat, I, you know, I was taken back to like watching those old um, National Geographic videos with my dad when I was like seven years old, like the lions in their natural habitat. And I thought, it is really natural for us to feel angry. It's a natural feeling. There's nothing bad about it. When it's, when it's really pure, it's love. Love for ourselves, love for others. And it's the becoming of that anger. It's the becoming, it's the ego just taking hold of our, like it takes hold of our mouth, right? And so it's slowing it down, moving ourselves into a meditative state while we're walking, while we're being off the cushion, whether that requires us to sit down and breathe, whether that requires us to take a walk, slowing that down and not just slowing it down to shut out the voice of anger, slowing it down to really be with that clarity behind the anger, to see what is it what unmet need am I having? Do I feel unseen? Is my pride wounded? And why? And how can I heal myself so that I can heal the world? I wrote here, anger is heart-wrenching, right? There's like a heart-wrenching about anger, particularly when it's the anger that we feel about the injustices of the world. It's heart-wrenching. And what happens when something's wrenching our heart, right? Usually that's a sign of love, of some kind of deep love that we're dying to experience, that we have a block. We need that clarity to kind of cut through. Adyashanti says, a response is inherently positive. A reaction is inherently negative and divisive. A great thing about coming to our own wholeness is not, is that it's not as though we just sit on our couch and see it, that everything is perfect. Wouldn't that be nice? We do see that everything is perfect, but from that sense of perfection arises great love, great compassion, and a great response to the life around us. It is a response that is undivided. As a whole, as a world cult culture, if there is going to be salvation, it's going to be it's going to have to come from the human heart being undivided. And to get there, we all have to wake up. And part of waking up includes anger. So I'd like to take you through a meditation now. And um, this will be a guided meditation followed by some silent sitting. So you can turn off your camera if that helps. You can leave it on. I will be here guiding you. Um, and the meditation will probably go for, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes, something like that. And at that point, we'll have some time for, I hope we'll have some time for some questions, thoughts, and sharing. So for those of you who aren't regular sitters, um, I have a posture technique that I really like. That's certainly not mine. It's been taught to me, but I really rely on it quite heavily, which is, um, you know, feet on the ground, either flat footed or crossed at the ankles, 
hands either on your knees or thighs or folded in your lap, but not locked one hand over the other, resting in your lap. And in order to sit up straight with your shoulders back so that your heart can come forward, it sometimes really helps to release the belly, like literally releasing the muscles of the belly so it sort of protrudes forward, almost like the Buddha. And what you'll notice is suddenly your spine can float very easily as if, if, as if the, your head is a balloon floating on top of a string and that string is your spine. So we'll begin by simply coming into contact with our breath. Noticing the cool air on both of our nostrils. I invite you to notice the cool air on both of the nostrils simultaneously. Noticing both the inhale and the exhale. Beginning on the next inhale to pull the breath from the nostrils, the back of the throat. Again, just noticing without story, what is the sensation of the breath as it comes into contact with the back of the throat? Perhaps there's things unspoken. Perhaps your jaw releases. Perhaps you feel the coolness or the warmth of the air as it passes back through the system. And on your next inhale, feeling the air as it passes both of your nostrils simultaneously hits the back of the throat and travels down into your, the back of your heart. This is the space between the shoulder blades where the ribs connect to the spine. And with each breath, as if you're pouring water from the nose to the back of the throat, down the throat, across the shoulders and into the back of the heart, just really noticing what's here. The back of the heart can be a place where we hold pain, stickiness, hurt, Grief, what's here? On the next inhale, pulling in oxygen past the nostrils, the back of the throat, down the back body and into the front body now, the front of the heart. Almost imagining the cage of the ribs with a beautiful heart suspended in the middle. Breathing deeply into that heart space. And again, just noticing Without story, what sensations are here? 
stickiness, darkness, patches of brown, bright patches, and just allowing joy, whatever is present, just allowing it to be met with the breath and slowly diffusing. On the next inhale, pulling the oxygen from your nose, throat, back of the heart, front of the heart, and down into your lower belly, two inches below the belly button, sometimes called the hara, the tantian. Some Eastern cultures believe this is where the soul enters the body. And again, breathing deeply into the body. Noticing what's there and allowing the breath to do the work. And if the mind wants to get involved, you can just tell it to go sit in the corner, pat its head like a good little puppy. We'll be with you. We'll be back with you later. We don't need you just right now. Coming back to the breath, back to the body. On this next inhale, breathing in through the nostrils, back of the throat, heart, lower belly, past the thighs, the knees, the calves, all the way down into the skin and the bottom of your feet, as if you could feel the skin from the inside out. Now breathing the whole body as if you could feel all of your skin from the inside out. Connecting with the I am, with awareness, with the sensation of awareness. Ageless, storyless, and I'd like to you to bring to mind to drop into the body. this experience of anger that you thought of. Notice where it perhaps first hit your system. Could be your head, your throat, your gut, your heart. Notice the, enter the actual energy itself without the story what does it feel like perhaps it's a tightening a gripping energy perhaps it's a hardening energy perhaps it's a fire a rage Perhaps it's quiet, but there. And offer this next breath 
into that energy. Perhaps the energy gets bigger with the breath. Perhaps it begins to pull apart and lessen a bit. Just notice what is happening in the energy of my body when I bring up this incident, this experience that created anger. And offering yourself the question, do I have an unmet need? Am I feeling seen? Do I feel worthy? And if the experience of anger that you are working with is righteous anger, big anger, anger at the injustices of the world, look and see where are you clinging to your way or the highway? Where is there room for someone else's anger or pain? Where is there room for the story to loosen, for the layers to peel back? How can you get further and further to the root of what you need to feel peaceful of what your anger wants to say and why. And the energy of the mind comes in to try to figure this out. Take a deep breath and return to the point in the body where you first felt the energy of anger. Coming back again and again to the sensation itself. The sensation will reveal. Resist the urge to dissolve fully into awareness. Stay with the somatic sensation. With awareness as the backdrop. Continuing to breathe.
And as you begin and continue to sense into the energy of this anger, notice how it shifts or changes. The energy with or without the story. Begin to offer it metta. To your own anger, may you be happy. May you find love. May you find healthy expression. May you feel seen. May you feel worthy. It takes a lot of faith to sit right in the middle of your existence. This is not the same as the faith that a doctrine or teaching or teacher is the truth. This is actually a belief which tells us how to interpret life and find comfort and safety within it. A belief provides a way of insulating ourselves from real faith from real trust. Faith in its truest sense is something different. Faith allows us to let go of belief of how we habitually translate each moment of our experience into a conceptual model that seems to make it easier to understand, seems to give us some sense of control and eases the feeling of insecurity we have whenever we find ourselves on some edge. Your edge could be challenges in your work or relationships. It could be illness or a loved one's death or even your own impending death. It could be you're feeling very challenged by the great sorrow of the world. A lot of things can make you feel like you're on the edge and you don't know what to do with it. takes a lot of faith to sit down right in the middle of your existence. So I've left a bit of time for some questions, if anyone has them. And Noam is gonna help me. You can just raise your hand in the chat if you have any questions at all, or any, any experiences you wanna share about this. And if, and if there are no questions, that's okay too.
Bob. Hi, Bob. Hey, thank you for that. Um, so I guess what I'd like to share is it's interesting how um, <clears throat> the gripping sensation of just anger <clears throat> and also how we hold on to it. I feel like <clears throat> whenever I do these practices and I have to try to breathe through, I see exactly how tight I am holding on, you know? And like one time I described my anger as like, I, you know, it's like all these dogs or these shadows that are that are biting at me. But then I realized one time I was like, I'm, I'm holding on to these dogs and, and I can let them go, you know? And I just, through these practices, I see that just how tightly I'm, I'm holding on and don't want to let go and just how really breathing through it is like, whew. <sighs> That's it, you know. You you really, you really gotta feel it and heal it, feel it to heal it. <laughs> to feel it. Yeah. What has it, it taught you about how those dogs are serving you? Well, you know, when I was younger, I went to I was uh, in juvenile hall when I was fourteen, and I just basically had to create a a, a just defense mechanism. So it's you know I through through honoring them has been a lot honoring that type of uh, anger and that type of aggression, um, especially at a young age. So I think that's been helping me too, to kind of honor that, that type of uh, anger. Some of these things, I think in my experience, people I've, I work with or do these practices with, it's been a lot of defense mechanisms or coping mm -hmm. mechanisms that have kind of mutated into some sort of situation or anger or frustration well and it sounds like you had a very extreme example of what it takes to survive in your life and 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 and, and had in some ways had to as a child or as a young adult build up um true survival mechanisms right that those could still could be in some ways there's a level of trauma there right and that yeah. trauma kind of tricks us into that sleepy dream where we start to react and you're exactly right like taking those deep breaths and coming back to the body and back to okay i'm not in this dream and also recognizing that i think even though many of us haven't had extreme versions of needing to survive in some ways we all have defense mechanisms right and having that open us up to the love for ourselves as you're so eloquently describing and and I I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say thank you for your honesty. Um, I, I love Dharma and I love the practice and I just love your honesty about your anger and just, I really appreciate teachers' vulnerability. Um, so thank you for that. I oh, respect thank and honor you. that. Thank you. Thank you. That is so nice to hear. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I think if I wasn't being honest, I would feel in, inauthentic, you know, because there's something about you know, I can remember being 29 and sitting my first retreat and thinking, wow, you know, these teachers are like, they really got it, you know, like they've, you know, and then through the years, you know, especially getting to see teachers in their, in their natural habitat and realizing, whoa, wait, nobody gets it. There's something a little scary about that at first, right? Yeah. Like nobody really knows for sure what's going on around here. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> I'm just sort of like allowing myself to really fall into the fact that there is a beautiful truth in knowing we're, we're all in this together. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. It's so nice to meet you. Thanks. Um, yeah, hey, I wanted to thank you for what you were saying about um, uh, anger being, um, I don't remember exactly how you how you said it, but it reminded me of something that someone had told me before, which is that ang anger is a messenger. It's a messenger telling me that some need of mine isn't being met. And anger is something that I've long been afraid of, afraid of feeling. 
uh, and I and I and I've been a big one to press it down and just definitely bypass around it and be like, no, no, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, until I can't anymore, and then it's very much not fine, and then I'm worried that I'm, you know, it's going to be like, anger's like this tiger, and I, I, and I'm. Just, that is a tail I'm holding onto the tail so tight and it's just whipping me around and around and and it's hard for me to get to that you know remember back to that 85 percent of being rational because yeah because at that at the point when I finally have allowed myself to feel it I I've pretty much lost all my rationality and it's and it's scary it's it's scary to me and it's it's only through I think practices like this that that I have hope of of being at peace with the fact that, yeah, I'm going to be angry sometimes. And sometimes people will be around me or express anger around me, which I'm equally afraid of. You know, it's uh, something that's been really tough for me in my whole life. I, you know, I would just do anything to appease. And, and then I sometimes feel like I'll do anything to appease myself if I'm starting to feel it because it seems like such a taboo emotion and being able to discuss it, especially in the context of, you know, Buddhist practice. And it's something that I don't hear come up a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wanted to just thank you and tell you how much I appreciate that because being able to hear that, that other people feel it, you know, no, matter, no matter how chill they are with their practice, no matter how much equanimity they've achieved, that it still sometimes can rise up and kind of spin, it can, it can really spin me around. So, so yeah, thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. And thank you for your honesty, too. You know, it's funny when I shared this talk with Eugene and I said I was going to be talking about anger and we got on our, our our teacher, you know, he's mentoring me. So we got on our call and he said, wow, you know, I'm really glad you're talking about anger because I'm so fucking pissed at someone right now. And after this meeting, I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to let him have it. And I thought, wow, <laughs> I didn't really expect that, you know? And he said, oh, he can take it. He's good. He can take my anger, right? And so much of what you're saying, right? This, this dance of fear of other people's anger and fear of our own anger coming up and what does it mean? And at the end of the day, oftentimes it can mean, I think, Suzanne, like this desperate fear that we're going to lose someone or that we're going to, like, they're going to walk away from us or not love us or not love our anger. And that can happen if that anger is aggression, right? If it's aggressive play, it can happen. But that's the trick, right? Is in that it's actually 15% that we stay reasonable and 85% that we go unreasonable. So really knowing, hey, there's 15% here somewhere. There's 15, yeah. <laughs> like somewhere in here, there's 15%. Yeah, thank you. I got this reverse there. And yeah, I think that's, that's very true. A lot of it for me is fear that like, oh my gosh, if, if I'm, if I'm not, you know, calm and easy all the time, like, yeah, nobody's going on to be around me. <laughs> like it's, yeah. and it, it is, it is really frightening at times. It really is. But being able to, to, to discriminate between, as you say, the uh, the difference between aggression and anger and sarcasm. Oh, that's a that's a tough one. I think I sublimate my anger into sarcasm a lot more than I'd like to admit. It's it's embarrassing, really. When I and I kind of call myself on it, and I'm like, oh, oh, what am I doing? Like, what is that? You know. So where when we did the meditation, or generally, where do you first notice it in your in your system in your body? Uh, first it's here, but then it's like, it's almost like an electrical storm in my head. It feels like this, this pressure, like I'm wearing a too tight of hat, you know, like I'm wearing a helmet, just like ugh, strapped on and feel it in my temples and between my eyes. Mm -hmm. And what, what would happen, even if you close your eyes right now and imagine that you're feeling that in your head and your temples, what if, what, what if you just felt it and felt it until you like, you can explode all over the room, like pieces of Suzanne everywhere. Like what happened <laughs> when you imagine that really? Yeah, I, it's, I don't, I don't know that I've ever done that. It's like, I don't even want to imagine. It's like, I think that I, I have this fear that it won't stop somehow, that it'll just keep going until like I burned myself out somehow. Maybe, maybe, maybe you'll, burn your, maybe you'll burn yourself all the way out. How glorious would that be? <laughs> Wouldn't be bad now that you mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> all if over it was the room. Out, yeah, all over the room. Oof. 
<laughs> Praise the glory. <laughs> what a way to go, right? What a way to go. Hey, at least it's authentic. <laughs> That's for sure. No suppression left there. No suppression left all over the walls. <laughs> Here I am. Right? Like that is the practice though. Like let it, let it, let it become, let it become you from a place of awareness. That's the trick, right? Otherwise it's just becoming you from a place of delusion. And you know what? Here's the funny thing. The place of delusion, like none of us is getting at, none of us is getting away with it. You know, we think we are like, oh, I'm suppressing it. No one notices. Everyone notices anyway, right? Because it's energy. We're all connected. We're feeling it from each other, right? So might as well just, let it rip in your, in, in within yourself. I'm not saying let it rip into aggression, but let it rip inside, feel it all the way through and see what happens. See what yeah, it happens. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Give it permission, blow, blow your head up. Thank you. Hey there. Um, I, I have thought about this several times and where I always get stuck is um, figuring out like what healthy, non-aggressive anger looks like in practice um, because I have a lot of models of what aggressive anger looks like and I'm very averse to that. And so kind of just suppress that in myself but I think it's because I don't really know like I get it conceptually but I have a hard time understanding you know I, there's not a lot of examples <laughs> in my life or in pop culture or anything of, of a healthy expression of anger well so what when you were thinking of your experience if you're willing to would you would you be willing to share what what your what your topic or experience that you used in the meditation was? Sure. Um, I was thinking about uh, my sister is one of the few people who can really stir up anger in me in a way that I that I can't really suppress. Um, and so I was thinking about an interaction with her. Um, and yeah, usually Usually when it comes out, uh, it's not, it's not in a very productive uh, way that, that we interact or argue. And is it usually, is it usually you that's sort of striking first or is she striking first and you're reacting? Uh, yeah, usually I'm reacting um, to a kind of uh, aggression or or bitterness, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So what does it sound like when you are in non-healthy reaction? What uh, is that you might say? Yeah, like something hurtful or condescending or defensive, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what might you, in those moments, did you, you know, if you're looking at sort of those two questions that the Buddha asked, like wounded pride or unfulfilled desire, mm -hmm. what, what feels most like of those two questions aligned with what's happening for you? Mm, probably unfulfilled desire, probably on both of our parts, I would imagine. Yeah. Desire for? Um, to be understood uh, or, yeah, yeah. To be seen by your sister. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this person I imagine you care about and love mm -hmm. deeply. Yeah. yeah. Suddenly there's a heartbreak that something happens even in the smallest of moments where she can't see you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, if you imagined talking about it from a place of clarity. 
what might you say if I'm your sister right now? What might you say? <laughs> Sorry, my my cat is talking. <laughs> Ignore the sweets. Right, join us. They can then they can have a conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, Gosh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I am realizing it's pretty simple, I guess, just expressing the, the pure feeling of like, you know, what you said made me feel un, unseen or diminished or, you know, something. Yeah, so maybe it would sound like Gosh, you know, I love you so much. And when you say things like that, I just, I feel so, I feel this deep desire to be loved by you and seen by you. It's, it, it hurts. Yeah, I guess I didn't realize that that was a version of anger. <laughs> that sounds so, that sounds so pleasant. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it can come out with some energy to it if it has to. Uh -huh. right? or or you can breathe and it can come out softer yeah you know boundaries are necessary mm. you know when you speak to me like that it really crosses a, a boundary of comfort for me that hurts mm. when we talk about what's happening between us like i i hate this That's really helpful. Yeah. Is it? Okay. Yeah. It is so simple, but it's really hard in the moment. Let me tell yeah. you. <laughs> and I the, mean, trick is, yeah. <laughs> the trick is really that, that slow down. Mm -hmm. Are you Sarah? Yeah. My, and my husband had to, <laughs> had okay. to duck out. Yeah. yeah. So it really, it really is that slow down. And so what the practice might be is in the moment or is, are you in person? Are you on the phone when you're usually talking to her? Uh, in person. Yeah. So you're in person and something comes up the trick right then and there is you notice that, where did you notice it in your body? Uh, kind of like a constriction in my throat and chest. Okay, so right here, as soon as that, that's your cue. And yeah. see if you can even play with it, right? Oh, cue. Take a breath and just, you know, silence. Just like in meditation, dropping into the body, dropping into awareness, what's here right now? If, if you get that far, <laughs> that is huge progress. If words right. never leave right. your lips. Yeah. Right? That is huge progress. Just to notice when it comes up and to intercept it. Yeah. With the breath, right? And, you know, in the same way that I think Dan was it, Bob, Bob was saying, you know, just that breathing into it so deeply and feeling it all the way through and really feeling like, gosh, I just want to love her. I want to be the sisters that I imagine you have moments where you have great love and joy and play together. I, I want that. I, I hate this. I hate when we disagree. It hurts. I hate when I feel unseen by her and unheard by her, right? And like just letting that feeling be in the depth of its heart wrench. Yeah. And then, then, then maybe at some point you can begin to bring the words forward. But even just the slow down and being with it Right. Remember I said, guess what? He can't fix it about my husband. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Our tendency is to say, I'm in this horrible place. And by the way, you can't see me and please fix it and stop. Stop so that you'll see who I really am and love me. Mm -hmm. Right. But the truth is that that slowdown, right. And that inner enemy is the first, it's like the first battle point is really the inner enemy. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more um, questions that I can answer? All right. I'm just gonna. I'm just reading some of your comments here. Thank you so much. All right. It's good to be with you all. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to be teaching in December, three days, I believe. Um, 
and I'll be, I'm sure SF Dharma will be announcing it. I'll be announcing it. You can also follow me on Instagram. I hate that, but you can. <laughs> it's Mary Jacobs SF or something like that. Um, and I'll announce it there as well. Um, it's so great to be back at SF Dharma Collective. I just love teaching in this community. So thank you, Noam. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Thanks, everyone.